So tonight, in particular, we're going to look at the formation of two churches that came out of the Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, the uh, Wesleyan Church and the Free Methodist. I want to give you some context <clears throat> for all of this, because both of them, uh, those uh, separations are either centered on the issue of slavery or it's a major theme. So just as you can kind of see visually, there's a number of major slave rebellions that are going on before the Civil War. Excuse me, Darren, did you did you turn on recording? It is. It should be automatically on. Okay. Okay. I just couldn't see it. Thanks. Oh, I see it now. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, thanks for checking. So there's a series of slave rebellions that have been popping up, uh, and and and, um, and and pushing that issue. The picture at the top is a lithograph of uh, Nat Turner. The picture at the bottom, the house, that is uh, Denmark Vesey's home in Charleston. And that is a current picture of it. Uh, it, is, it is still a private residence. Uh, there's a historical marker out front, but I just find it very strange to think that you could be the homeowner living in this house that an insurrectionist like Denmark Vesey uh, staged a, a major rebellion in. So um, there are various um, uh, things going on to ameliorate it. Uh, one uh, is that in the northern states, especially after the Revolutionary War, they begin to pass emancipation laws. Uh, 1780 was the first one in Pennsylvania. They started it in 1780, really kind of gets finalized and enacted um, uh, near the end of the decade. Uh, but Connecticut and Rhode Island right after uh, the Revolutionary War ends. Uh, New York, it was a, an emancipation law. The first one was 1799, that's more for children. And then uh, the, by 1817, that's ended. So you have that going on, which creates a greater separation between North and South. Um, the American Colonization Society um, was dedicated to solving slavery by uh, repatriating slaves to primarily West Africa. So it starts in 1817. And then the more radical version, abolitionism takes off in 1833 with the American Anti-Slavery Society. And that's William Lloyd Garrison and uh, the newspaper, The Liberator. Um, and running in between those is kind of the notion of, of gradual emancipation. But also along with that are various arguments for not abolishing slavery, but rather for um, um, kinder, gentler treatment of slaves that go on as well. At the same time, down in the southern states, uh, there is the ever greater tightening of the slave codes, which had always been there. But by 1850, they've really clamped down on it. So by that year, all Southern states had legal prohibitions on religious gatherings of slaves. You know, prior to that, slaves, depending on what area they're in, uh, were able to have a, a modicum of freedom to be able to go off in the woods and worship or worship in their cabin you know, or for, um, for white missionaries uh, to conduct religious services with them by 1850, even that has been clamped down because of the threat of rebellion. Now keep in mind in the South, uh, three quarters of white citizens did not own slaves. Of those that did, uh, nearly 90% of them only owned uh, 20 or fewer slaves. Um, the, um, so this is, that's kind of the larger context that's going on. Specifically in Methodism, Wesley was always opposed to slavery and published uh, in the 1770s uh, his uh, pamphlet, Thoughts Upon Slavery, which had a big impact uh, among Methodists and, and kind of beyond that. Uh, Asbury, Francis Asbury is uh, in line with Wesley. Uh, he is opposed to slavery, always was opposed to slavery. Uh, this great quote from him, he says, I'm strongly persuaded that if Methodists will not yield on this point and emancipate their slaves, God will depart them. Wow. And, and, and kind of throughout his ministry, he is just kind of deeply troubled with this issue of 
what do we do with the issue of slavery uh, among Methodists? Because it just runs against uh, the theology, uh, the spirituality uh, of the movement. Um, the, um, even before the denomination was actually founded, four years prior in 1780, uh, when he was conducting the conference, he required all preachers to deliver anti-slavery sermons, okay? But here's where the rub comes in, and you'll see it immediately with this next slide. Methodism is growing in America in the first half of the 19th century. Exponential growth. As you can see on the line there, in 1800, we have 65,000 members, and by 40 years later, we're almost at 900,000 members. So it's just taking off like a rocket. I mean, just, you know, doubling, tripling every, every 10 years. There's this incredible growth. And Asbury and the other Methodists will see this as the hand of God, uh, as proof of their fruitfulness of doing the work of God, of evangelizing. And that creates the rub, obviously, between on the one hand, evangelization, uh, and the other hand, this uh, social witness. That's one of the main differences between Methodism and uh, Quakers on this point, because Quakers are not growing and expanding in that way. And thus, that uh, demographic isolation, it means it's easier to handle. The other thing that is different is that Methodists are connected with one another. If you are a Methodist in Vermont, uh, you are sharing the same polity, the same book of discipline with a Methodist uh, down in Georgia. And so there comes in the rub. We can't just kind of live and let live with people having differences. And, and it just plagues Wesley over and over again about what to do with this because their stance becomes known in society and they get a lot of opposition for it. Before I describe the opposition, let me go over the official policy and how it morphed uh, over the course of basically 20 years. So the founding conference was in Baltimore on Christmas 1784, and they put into that first book of discipline uh, an, a ban on all members owning or buying slaves. Mm -hmm. They also said that as a part of your class meeting, uh, if you have a slave, that they were to assist you with the emancipation uh, within a year of helping you work out a plan for uh, a plan of manumission. And of course, there's a ban on preachers owning, buying slaves as well. So this is a very anti-slavery stance, uh, and, you know, had real teeth to it uh, and was actually, um, you know, put into practice. Uh, for example, in the Delmarva Peninsula, between 1791 and 1799, there were a thousand slaves that were freed in just three counties alone. Uh, and most of that was due to um, uh, Methodist uh, freeing their slaves. I mean, for example, there's a story of a Judge Thomas White uh, freeing his slaves and how dramatic that was, this county judge of doing that. So you saw it uh, having a, um, a, a, a specific impact, uh, tangible impact on a very local level. Uh, the story last week about uh, Freeborn Garrison preaching and converting uh, Richard Allen's uh, owner uh, is right in line with that. So it's happening. But remember, in the beginnings of Methodism, there was no general conference. Uh, they, out of necessity, were creating different, what we today would call annual conferences. And so you had Wesley going from one to the next to the next and say the one up in New Jersey would adopt one thing, the one in South Carolina would adopt another, and kind of little by little over the course of a few years, um, by the first general conference, uh, these rules have gotten severely curtailed and rolled back. Right. Um, and then by 1796, it basically rolls back to a clergy-only ban. Uh, preachers are to inform their members that we have this stance. We think that slavery is evil. Uh, that never changed of having that stance, but it doesn't have any teeth anymore. There's language in that 1796 discipline um, uh, requiring uh, uh, 
members that if they uh, buy a slave, they have to uh, give the slave manumission, but it kind of contradicts an, another rule. Uh, but basically, it were beginning to back off of that. And it really was coming down to a bargain about, are we going to grow or are we going to take the stance? And I, I don't want to say that flippantly because in taking that stance, Methodists across the South were being persecuted because of the stance. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of the Book of Discipline, by the Book of Discipline of 1800, uh, it simply has been boiled down to uh, a pastoral letter on slavery uh, from the bishops. Okay. Uh, so again, what you've got is uh, a stance on a social issue, but really no teeth behind it, and an ethical double standard, one standard for members, another standard for clergy. And then finally, by 1804, because even that pastoral letter had been so controversial in the South, they started printing two different versions of the Book of Discipline. So those copies of the Book of Discipline that were distributed in Virginia and South Carolina and North Carolina omitted all references to slavery. The, um, the reason why they did that is because they were getting their teeth kicked in in the South. So here's a case study about what goes on in Charleston. As Asbury called it, the seat of Satan. <laughs> I like that part. <laughs> um, in 1793, um, Asbury has traveled back there and he goes in and out of Charleston uh, a couple times a year. In 1793, whites refused him lodging in their homes uh, or even in slave quarters for fear that he would spread anti-slavery views. Um, at one point, he's traveling back uh, into the low country and he has a guide who is taking him through the swamps and he begins to witness to him about the evils of slavery as a sin and the guide abandons him in the swamp. Um, uh, now imagine at this time in, in Charleston, there's about 500 Methodists in the city, 300 of them are black. So the majority of Methodist members are black, whether slave or free. And there was a substantial uh, population of, of free black uh, citizens in uh, Charleston. Uh, preaching was rejected by whites, but it was embraced by blacks. 1795, he's down there and there's a riot of young men while he's preaching at home. They broke in the windows and they attempted to storm the church while he was preaching. They were uh, rebuffed. Uh, one of our um, local preachers, John Harper, um, he had copies of that general conference uh, pastoral address from 1800, uh, and there was uh, a riot uh, that took place outside his home. 200 men surrounded his home and demanded that he burn those copies. Here's a greater story. George Daughtery is a local preacher, Methodist local preacher. He was operating a school for black children and and conducting prayer meetings with them. And after a prayer meeting, a mob seized him and held him under a water pump. Oh. And, he, and he would have drowned, it would have drowned him if not for a Methodist woman by the name of Martha Coopley, who rushed through the mob and stuffed her dress in the spout of the pump and thus prevented him from drowning. Wow. That will be a sermon illustration one day. <laughs> Isn't that great to see her? Amazing. Shove, shove her dress at the pump. So, uh, and what's going on in the midst of all that in reaction, the South Carolina General Assembly had passed a law in reaction to Methodists and others outlawing these slave assemblies without whites being present or at night. So in that context, I mean, one of our preachers was tarred and feathered. Uh, because he was a Methodist, it was associated with slavery. So, you know, this is a fledgling movement, but it's growing, and, uh, and you see that kind of pressure on, uh, on uh, Asbury. Yeah. So there's another attempt uh, to deal with this issue, and that is to accept slavery 
but to minister to slaves with evangelistic services and religious education. And at the forefront of that is William Capers. Uh, Capers was born uh, near Charleston. His father was a rice planter. Uh, in 1828, he becomes the presiding elder of Charleston District, uh, which a presiding elder is, that's a forerunner of a district superintendent. In 1833, he writes a catechism for slaves, a catechism book of religious instruction, uh, but specifically that can be used uh, with slaves. And as you can imagine, um, you know, it counsels based on the writings of Paul that slaves are to obey their masters and that uh, masters are to be um, kind uh, and not abusive of their slaves. Um, by 1840, he becomes the head of a Southern missionary department in the denomination. And within about three years, uh, there are up to 80 missionaries across the South who are working with about 22,000 slaves. Uh, after the separation, between North and South, he will become a bishop uh, in the Methodist Episcopal South. So you have that going on. In addition to that, he was also he'd been a, a, a missionary among uh, Creek Indians, I believe, uh, and had uh, promoted um, missionary work in, in other nations as, as well. So that's yet another response to all of that. All right. So that kind of takes me up to the formation of the Wesleyan Church, which originally were known as Wesleyan Methodists, and that break will take place in 1843. But to get there, where'd it go to? All right. To get there, we start with a Methodist preacher by the name of Orange Scott. He was born in Vermont. Uh, he is uh, he has his conversion experience at a camp meeting in 1820. And within two years, uh, he is ordained uh, and begins to uh, preach on a circuit. Well, by 1833, which you remember the founding of the American Anti-Slavery Society, he embraces abolitionism, becomes an ardent abolitionist. Uh, at this time, he is a presiding elder. <clears throat> and as an abolitionist, he subscribed he, get, he, he bought 100 subscriptions to William Lloyd Garrison's uh, newspaper, The Liberator, uh, for 100 of his preachers in his district. That really honked off a number of other Methodists and bishops in particular. There is a general conference that happens the next year in 1834. Uh, there are petitions from abolitionists. Uh, to tighten down uh, our stance on slavery. Those attempts fail, uh, but at the center of that is what Orange Scott did. And following that, the bishops, which I think there were three at that time, uh, confronted him and said, you are either gonna stop your work for abolition or we're gonna reappoint you. He refused to stop. And so they reappointed him to Lowell, Massachusetts which at that time was a backwater appointment. So he got a, a demotion. Yet while he was there for one year, uh, the church grew by 120 members. And then the, follow the following year, <coughs> the following year, uh, he uh, becomes a full-time agent <coughs> for the American Anti-Slavery Society, one of, that's known as the 70. There are 70 uh, agents that, Garrison employs, and so he's traveling around the country uh, preaching abolitionism. Uh, he returns back to Lowell in 39 and then is uh, uh, elected that year and goes to general conference as a delegate in 1840. Um, he dies seven years later of tuberculosis. Uh, wow. but, but before he dies, um, he helps to found this denomination. Um, there were other abolitionists around him. Uh, uh, Leroy Sunderland was the editor of Zion's Watchman, the Methodist uh, uh, magazine. Uh, Sunderland had faced numerous trials. Hey, if uh, folks could, if you could mute, uh, that will help me. I'm getting some feedback. Thank you. Um, 
So he's put on, on, on trials at different times. There's a trial in, of him in 1840, uh, and uh, it was for slander against Bishop Sewell, uh, and he was found guilty of that. The irony is, is that Bishop Sewell presided over his trial. So uh, there's another, a Jotham Horton, it's one of the early founders of Wesleyan Church, an elder uh, who was appointed to several New England cities as a delegate at those general conferences. All of them were a part of the first abolitionists to leave and, and uh, they, they walked out of the denomination uh, and they were quickly followed uh, by another influential person who was Luther Lee, uh, Methodist preacher. He comes to abolitionism late in 37, but in the new denomination, he will shape uh, their theology and their church structure. They called him Logical We. Uh, later in life, he will actually help found uh, the Liberty Party, a short-lived third political party uh, in the United States. Um, there's another one uh, who is um, uh, by now Lucius Matlack, who's denied ordination twice uh, because of his abolitionist views. But those, those uh, five uh, men are really at the core of organizing this new denomination. And uh, they put out a periodical called the True Wesleyan uh, that uh, Orange Scott edited and then Matlack edited uh, that really kind of drove and publicized what they were doing. Um, so they, they leave the Methodist Episcopal Church in November of 1842. Just prior to that, there were other individual congregations that had left in Ohio and in New York and Michigan. Uh, one in Utica, New York actually took on the name Wesleyan Methodist Church, actually started creating their own little book of discipline. And then that Michigan church uh, joined them. So there was, before the actual denomination was founded, there was these individual breakaways. There was these five men uh, that left. And in the middle of all of this, um, there are conventions that are held of like-minded Methodists. The first one there in February of 43 in Andover, um, there's nine preachers there and 43 lay persons. Uh, and then the second one, which is really what starts the denomination is in Utica, New York, uh, May 31st. Uh, George Pegler hosted it at his church Methodist Episcopal Church, 6,000 charter members. What's interesting to me is that the, the Wesleyan Methodist uh, connection begins not just with Methodists, but it attracts a whole variety of other folks who are all united around abolitionism. So in the founding of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, um, there are there's Baptists who are in there. There are free will, free will Baptists, Episcopalian, Congregationalist, even some uh, Unitarians. And again, it's because we are founding this left-wing revolutionary abolitionist denomination. Um, in Indiana, the annual conference will form uh, a few years later in 1848. So it's here pretty early. Uh, mostly it's, it's really centered in New England and then kind of spreads out uh, into around the Great Lakes. So one of those six original founding areas is the Miami Conference. There's the Michigan Conference. So it kind of sweeps in, in that direction. Um, their name is not church. It is Wesleyan Methodist Connection. And at the heart of what they're doing are two things. One is anti-slavery. The other is anti-episcopacy. So like the Methodist Protestants, they reject having bishops. And the reason why they chose connection and not church was because Luther Lee's understanding is that what is a true church is that local congregation, not the denomination. Right? The denomination is a federation or a connection of various churches. And so thus the name connection. And they went with that for many, many years, for decades before they actually changed and adopted the, uh, the name Wesleyan Church. Um, the, the word connection is a very old Methodist connection. 
Wesley would use that. We still use it today. Um, but it was a, for Luther Lee, it was a theological point as well. Um, so it's a much more uh, horizontal, flatter, decentralized uh, system. It's essentially what you would call a Presbyterian model as opposed to an Episcopal model. So instead of bishops, uh, you don't have bishops. Uh, they adopted their elementary principles directly from the Methodist Protestant Church, which of course we stayed last week had you know, broken away or two weeks ago. Uh, so instead of bishops, they have conference presidents who were part-time elected by the conference, would serve for a four-year term up to two terms. And there were still appointments that are made even to this day, but the appointments are done by a committee, the stationing committee. And that's the difference between Episcopalian and Presbyterian in system. You can kind of think Presbyterian means you have a Presbytery. It's a committee uh, as opposed to a bishop. There was um, a right to refuse an appointment uh, and there were equal members of lay and clergy uh, that were members of the, uh, of the conference as well. Uh, in addition to that, there was the issue early on about Freemasonry, about whether or not you could be a Methodist and be a member of the lodge. Um, the, the, um, the reason being is uh, Freemasonry uh, requires a, a secret oath and you would have certain uh, kind of uh, biblical prohibitions on oath taking, but more importantly, it's about being connected with one another. And uh, if you're a member of the lodge, here is this deep fraternity, and that stands direct competition with your fraternity, if you will, with your fellow Methodists, specifically Methodist preachers, uh, serving in connection with one another or with your class meeting. They're divided on this. The founding convention uh, had a motion to ban it. They deferred it to local churches. There's a regional split uh, up in Northeast. They're fairly tolerant of it. Some of these early Methodist leaders, they were actually Freemasons, but it's in the Midwest. There's a very strong anti-Freemasonry strain there uh, as well. Um, Sunderland actually left the movement uh, because of it, went back to the Methodist Episcopal Church. The other issue that they uh, deviate on is about infant baptism. Uh, they make it optional uh, versus um, it being um, yeah, that Anglican tradition <coughs> that we inherited. Um, let's see here. And then finally, they have, they have one of the beginnings, one of the earliest statements on holiness, which we'll really talk about next week. It's like a little seed that gets planted there. They found schools uh, in uh, Michigan, uh, uh, Leonie, I think I'm pronouncing that, Leonie, Michigan Theological Institute. Wheaton College was originally a Wesleyan Methodist uh, college. It's now non-denominational and probably one of their big ones is Houghton College up in uh, upstate New York. Now, obviously they were involved in the Underground Railroad uh, when you read uh, Orange Scott and I read the autobiography of Luther Lee, they are um, stories of, of supporting that, being a part of that. Um, Laura Smith Haviland and her husband um, in Michigan started the first station on the Underground Railroad that was there. Um, there's a Wesleyan Methodist Church in uh, La Oda, Indiana, which is up by Fort Wayne which was a station on the Underground Railroad. I think I pronounced that right. But in particular, they take on doing direct evangelism and anti-slavery work in the Deep South. Um, and it begins in 1847 with a man by the name of Adam Crooks, who is a young man in his early 20s in Ohio a part of this new denomination. And uh, at age 23, he volunteers to go south, goes down to North Carolina. Uh, he ends up at Mendenhall Plantation, which is a, a Quaker farm run without slaves uh, up in the Piedmont area of North Carolina, so Western North Carolina. Richard Mendenhall 
is the head of the North Carolina Manumission Society. He helps him get started. That part, that region, those uh, counties were known as the Quaker Belt. And uh, if you know anything about Civil War history, there was a portion of that part of the South there and kind of around Knoxville uh, that is um, pro-union and actually uh, does not side with the Confederacy. So it's, it's kind of in that vein. Uh, he quickly is able in uh, Alamance County to uh, build what is called Freedom's Hill, a meeting house, which you see there in the corner of your screen that's been restored. And he, uh, they built it in October, 1847. It's the first Wesleyan Methodist church in a slave state. Uh, and then brings on additional leaders, uh, Jesse McBride. And uh, within two years, there are eight Wesleyan churches in North Carolina and Virginia, Virginia with two dozen preaching stations uh, and over 500 members by 1851. Now, needless to say, this doesn't sit too well. Freedom's Hill door was riddled with bullets and vandalized repeatedly. Uh, they were uh, prohibited from speaking on public grounds. Uh, uh, Crooks, Adam Crooks, was dragged from his pulpit and jailed on one occasion. On another occasion, he and McBride were uh, uh, poisoned twice, lived to tell about it. There was an assassination attempt against him. McBride was almost strangled to death as he tried to enter a Wesleyan Methodist church to preach. And finally, by 1851, Crooks and McBride and Bacon are expelled from the state. And they, these guys never really recover from this. Like, I think it's um, uh, Jarvis Bacon, I want to say he, he died within about a year or two after that. I mean, they have suffered psychic damage, physical damage from this. Now, there's still Wesleyans there, and they're hanging on, uh, and they experienced persecution during the Civil War. For example, a Micaiah McPherson was lynched during the Civil War by a, a mob uh, that was seeking to conscript, uh, conscript his uh, son, Thomas. Uh, they hanged him. They hanged McPherson, and they thought he was dead. Uh, and they, uh, but they had uh, cut down his body too soon, and his wife was able to revive him. Gosh. Good wife. Um, last year of the, um, of the war, just a, four months before Appomattox Courthouse, 1865, the uh, Holland family's three sons were executed by Confederate vigilantes. Uh, one boy who was 12 years old were hanged, and the other two were shot. Uh, and it says, quote, the floor of a Lovejoy Wesleyan Methodist Church was permanently stained with their blood when the bodies were laid there prior to their burial. If you've ever read, was a cold mountain? Get, it's that dynamic, right? Um, Shady Grove Wesleyan Church in Colfax, North Carolina is built on the site of one of the worst mob attacks that is there. So that's the first mission to the South. It is repeated. There's a much smaller mission right on the eve of the Civil War in 1857 by one of our own, a Daniel Worth, who was a former North Carolina native. Um, he was the second uh, president of the denomination, Indiana State Senator. Right? His brother, Jonathan, would become, uh, no, cousin, sorry, Jonathan would become the governor of North Carolina. In 1857, he returned to North Carolina and started preaching and distributing anti-slavery literature. For that, he was arrested uh, in December uh, of 59. He was held in an unheated cell that caused permanent physical damage to him, and eventually he fled the state. So there was all that. They were living out their faith around those issues. Um, their sense of equality extended to women. And if you know anything about women's history, you know that there was the significant convention in Seneca Falls, July of 1848, that drafted the Declaration of Sentiments. That was held in a Wesleyan church. There was uh, the Wesleyan church at George Pegler, uh, who had hosted the founding of the denomination. Um, and so from the very beginning, Wesleyans are feminists. 
Uh, they ordained women from the very beginning. Uh, they rescinded some of that in 1879, limiting women to being licensed ministers. But then in 1891, they restored full ordination uh, for women in ministry. So they've got that in their history. Now, because they have a lot of similarities with Methodist Protestants, especially after the Civil War, there is an attempt to merge. It's called the Union Movement. Started right before the Civil War with the first attempt in 53. Um, but the real hang up was that the Methodist Protestants did not have a prohibition on being a member of the lodge. Now at that point in 53, if you remember from two weeks ago, the Methodist Protestant church had divided. So this Methodist Protestant church was just the ones up North. After the civil war in 65, they attempt to merge again, but the Methodist Protestants had Adrian college uh, and uh, the internal politics of Adrian, Michigan, and within the college, they were trying to bring on board Wesleyans. It didn't work out, and that left a bad rift. So finally, it kind of continued on until it collapsed in 67. They actually scheduled to have a general conference together. All the Methodist Protestant delegates showed up, and the Wesleyans just didn't show, which I think is absolutely fascinating. It's like they didn't even bother telling them, hey, we're not coming. No, we don't want to do that. They just, they dissed them. So there was that attempt at merger, but it never really went through. After the Civil War, there is a major crisis in the Wesleyan Methodist connection, uh, and they almost go out of business. Uh, the first thing that happens is a number of their key leaders return to the Methodist Episcopal Church, such as Luther Lee, and that was for obvious reasons, because the issue that divided them slavery was now gone. They lost all their major leaders. They lost university professors. When you read it, they really lost the intelligentsia of the denomination. And they also lost members overall. There's a, a good 15% membership loss uh, after that union movement collapsed uh, and in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, so there's this moment where, you know, they may just kind of go out of business uh, because of, uh, of these losses. Um, the person who keeps the denomination going is Adam Crooks. Again, remember that young man that went to North Carolina and uh, suffered uh, permanent physical injury. Uh, he rallies them uh, and holds them together. The, the story is, is he had been uh, praying all night, seeking God's will about what to do and, and whether to return to the ME church or to continue this endeavor with the denomination. And finally at, at daybreak, he, he hears the voice of God saying, go forward. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, and so he persisted. Um, but what happens, and this is the real shift that, 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 that goes on at this point is that the combative notion in Wesleyan Methodist, the, uh, the passion that is there shifts from the political issue of slavery to the spiritual issue of holiness. Um, all that passion and drive of social reform now takes on a spiritualized, highly personalized dimension. Um, at the same time, the denomination that, from what I can tell, has taken a couple of steps down socioeconomically, so it's a much poorer denomination. It has shifted also from its center of gravity in the Northeast to the Midwest, and specifically into Indiana. And so illustrating this is this interesting quote from Crooks, who says, and at this time he was editing a, a, a newspaper called The American Wesleyan. He says, but the chief aim of the American Wesleyan shall be to promote the great work of salvation in all its stages. Under God, having some degree been influential in securing the physical liberty of the oppressed poor of the land, so shall it earnestly labor in cooperative effort with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the higher spiritual liberty of all oppressed by sin and the devil. 
my take on that is, is that all of that passion and language of liberation on a political level then gets transferred into this very spiritualized, uh, individualized uh, uh, view. Uh, and, and thus the, the denomination takes this turn and a lot of this history is then lost. Um, and next week when we talk about the holiness movement, you'll see kind of how they really get involved in that. And uh, it really goes in, in this different trajectory. So it's no reason uh, that people like Lynn growing up was in others never heard any of this stuff. So now while all of that is going on, the Methodist Episcopal Church is struggling with the issue of slavery. And the following year, 1844, the Methodist Episcopal Church divides. They divide over the issue of slavery. Now remember back, the rule uh, was that um, now it, it was a, a prohibition, a ban only on preachers owning slaves, right? Um, they have gone back and forth about what to do about the issue of slavery uh, all along up until, you know, 1842, there are abolitionist petitions that are sent to general conference. Uh, all of them fail. Uh, you know, the, the high water mark uh, that really happened the last substantial general conference to really deal with it uh, would have been in um, 1824. Um, but from that moment on, it just kind of slides off. Um, at one point, there is um, a majority of delegates that favor a, um, a more uh, abolitionist stance, but it doesn't pass because the rule was you had to have a two thirds majority. So um, that influences the creation of the Wesleyan Church because they realize they're never going to change. They're going to the Methodist Episcopal Church is just going to continue to argue over this issue ad nauseum, and then that's exactly what they did all the way uh, to the bitter end. Um, so, in 1844, uh, there are still Southern churches uh, annual conferences in the South. They're part of the denomination. It comes to a head. Um, at the General Conference, which was held in New York City at Green Street Methodist Church. It goes from May 1st to June 11th. I mean, this is like over a month they're on this thing. There are two things that happen. First, there is a, uh, a Methodist uh, preacher out of Baltimore by the name of Francis Harding, um, who was, uh, so, uh, uh, he had acquired slaves by marriage, right? And uh, um, he had been suspended and appealed his case uh, and it lost. But the, the bigger thing that happens is with Bishop Andrew. Uh, Bishop Andrew, who was elected in 1832, comes out of Georgia. Uh, his first wife had slaves. And when she died, here's where the problem comes in, inheritance. He inherited a, a teenage girl and a boy. She did not want to leave. He was too young uh, to be sold. And the state of Georgia banned emancipation. So this guy's stuck. On top of that, he remarries a woman. She has slaves. So he also has indirectly slave ownership by way of his wife. So the pressure from Northern delegates is this is the tipping point we got to just cleanse the church of this kind of stuff. Um, there's a resolution asking him to voluntarily resign. That doesn't work. And then finally, um, keep it wrong button. there is a committee of nine that is organized to draw up plans of separation. Uh, they draw up plans of separation. And then over the course of the next few years, you see this forming and sorting out between what is in the north, which just retains the name Methodist Episcopal, and then in the south, M.E. South, and you see that going forward. All of that uh, is taking place in the, in the wake of that Wesleyan denomination forming. But even after 1844, 
the northern denomination will not create a more robust stance on slavery. Uh, they just will not pull the trigger on that. Um, and that brings up, in part, the formation of the Free Methodist Church, which culminates in 1860, there on the eve of the Civil War. In order to understand what's going on with the Free Methodists, it's more than slavery at this point. And that's where you got to understand this sociological context. What's happening in Methodism is Methodism has grown, not just numerically, but it has finally come of age. It has finally risen from being a lower class, uh, working class denomination to really becoming a part of the solid middle of the demographics in the United States. And so you see it going from being what you might call a sect to being more like a church. And so this huge cultural transition gets played out in a variety of ways in the denomination. You see it with the following things. There is a shift, an evolution from preaching stations to local churches. By preaching station, it literally is what it says. It is a barn, uh, a stump, uh, a tent over there, and the preacher would show up every month and preach there. I mean, that's how North began as a preaching station, I believe in 1840, and then evolved into Mapleton Methodist Episcopal Church. So it's the settling down and becoming actual local congregations that you and I would recognize today. Along with that, having a uh, preacher on a circuit serving all of these, uh, increasingly they become more robust as standalone congregations and now you have appointments being made to one church. Now, often you would be appointed to a single church, but then responsible for a number of smaller stations around you. So this didn't change overnight. This is what's developing over the course of 20, 30 years, but more and more going in that shift. There's also the slow decline of the class meeting, uh, which is huge in terms of support, accountability to one another, the lessening of a sense of covenant uh, with one another. And with that is really a shift in the understanding of the clergy, uh, going from being a circuit writer to now taking on this term minister. Uh, and that is a huge, huge shift uh, for the clergy, a different understanding of that role. They still had uh, appointments that were being made, and the maximum time that you could stay at a church was two years. So there's still this constantly moving around, but increasingly becoming more settled with parsonages and more and more clergy having wives. Uh, there were always preachers that would marry, but usually when they married, they stopped circulating. They became, they took on, they were what were called stationed, and uh, they became a local preacher. But now you have wives being appointed along with this. That creates this, this kind of psychic social pressure on the fabric of the denomination that the free Methodists are going to react to. Um, the other feature to understand at this time, and specifically in upstate New York, is what happened with the Second Great Awakening, which begins approximately 1800. And that's the camp meetings that we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Second Great Awakening keeps evolving, uh, keeps professionalizing, uh, fine tuning quite literally the technique. And the person at the forefront of that is the guy you see on the side there, Charles Finney, uh, Mr. Warm and Fuzzy. <clears throat> Boy, with a, with a face like that, he makes me feel like I love Jesus. <clears throat> But Finney, in his lectures on revivalism, talks about the new measures and taking those camp meetings, and they become what are called protracted meetings. So they're more professional. They are a what today you might call a revival, and they begin to use that language. And um, it becomes a technique. And so in order to stir up membership, to revive your, your, your existing members' commitment, as well as to gain new members, they're holding repeatedly these protracted meetings, these extended revivals. And at the epicenter of that was upstate New York, that 
has so many of them that become known as the burned over district. You know, the imagery of the Holy Spirit and being on fire and reviving you. Well, Holy Spirit showed up so many times in upstate New York, it was burned up. Um, what comes out of that also are a lot of reform notions. Abolitionism, feminism is fueled by this. And so you going back to the Wesleyan Methodist, it's right in the middle of this, uh, this stream of Second Great Awakening. So is the early free Methodist. That's the backdrop to what happens with B.T. Roberts, who is the founder of Free Methodist. Benjamin Titus Roberts is born and raised in upstate New York, uh, Lodi, New York. Um, his father is, uh, has his conversion experience uh, at one of those uh, uh, meetings at the hands of one of uh, Finney's uh, associates. Uh, and then that later influences uh, uh, B.T. B.T. starts off as a law student, he is uh, 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 an apprentice in law, uh, but then uh, comes home uh, to his family and uh, at a, uh, a, a, a prayer meeting, one of these uh, meetings that takes place, um, he is converted. Has his conversion experience, uh, hearing the testimony of, um, of an illiterate uh, blacksmith. And, uh, and then that begins him thinking about his calling and begins to realize that um, uh, his calling into, uh, well, there was no calling into law, but rather that was driven by his, uh, his pride and his ego. And so he said, quote, I, I was ambitious, proud, worldly, and at times I was powerfully convicted, but I thought it was part of manliness to resist as long as possible. Conviction left me and my heart became hard. And then finally, um, he, he, you know, relented. And he said, it was my duty to become a Christian. Um, and finally came to peace with God. Um, he goes on to, uh, to study uh, for upstate New York. And then he uh, goes to Wesleyan University, which is one of ours, fairly newly founded. He is... Uh, He's no backwoods hick. He is a uh, Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, and while he is at Wesleyan University, he actually becomes involved as a Sunday school teacher at the AME Zion Church uh, that is there in town. Um, he is a early convert to abolitionism, actually prior to his conversion experience. And uh, abolitionists were a clear minority on that campus. Um, he marries Ellen, uh, who had lived in New York City, had been deeply influenced by the Palmers, which next week we'll talk about them and the holiness movement. She's educated. She is a, a graduate of Rutgers Female Institute, has a similar uh, conversion experience, uh, and they are married soon after his first appointment uh, in 1848. But he is a proponent of this revivalism. And so every appointment he goes to, he's doing these protracted meetings, teeing up uh, these revivals to revive uh, his appointment. Uh, has some success uh, at the church in Buffalo. Uh, there's a blowback uh, to it. Um, and, uh, and, and a pretty bitter experience with other um, clergy members of his annual conference who interfered with that. Um, here are the issues underlying this and how they get played out. And again, it goes back to the notion of holiness. And, and if you think of holiness as being completely consumed by the experience of God, by the love of God, and being totally 100% dedicated to God is what we're talking about. And so um, first, what they were bothered about was the aim of sanctification uh, being uh, uh, misdirected by the issue of slavery. I mean, think about it. Slavery is a sin. How can you be a slave owner and be holy, right? But there are other issues that get in the way of this, such as pew rental. Uh, pew rental was a fundraising scheme that was increasingly being done during this time. Um, uh, you know, for example, I think it was like 10 cents a month 
uh, would be kind of a pew rental fee that would raise money. Um, That's something we're talking about at North now. Yeah. yeah, 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 parking lot, <clears throat> parking spaces. Um, no, that's a speedway thing. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the notion of raising money through peer rental really represents two things. One, you're building buildings uh, that are not preaching stations that require more money to build them. Uh, and number two, you have a constituency that can afford this. So there is that blowback against pew rental because now you're introducing class division into the church and you're diverting the focus on the poor. So it's very much about rich versus poor uh, in, uh, in that as well. Um, the other issue is membership in lodges or secret societies and in particular uh, the, uh, the Freemasons, but also the Odd Fellows, uh, which were growing by leaps and bounds at this time. For example, uh, the Masons in New York State, in 1840, there were 79 lodges. 20 years later, there will be 432 lodges. Odd Fellow membership, 1843, was 30,000. By 1860, it's 200,000. Right. Now, here's the problem with joining the lodge if you are a Methodist preacher. The lodge is this fraternal organization, this connection uh, that you have with other men. That's in direct conflict with your fraternal connections, your covenant with other preachers. So it was seen in direct competition with the church and specifically with the church connection promoting holiness. Now, the attraction to membership in the lodge for a Methodist preacher was that if you were moving every two years, that gave you a connection uh, in a new location, right? Uh, that would be very useful socially and even financially. But there, again, there's this blowback against um, uh, going uptown, if you will, becoming respectable. That's played out not just in the aim of sanctification, but even in the method. Again, the emphasis on revivalism. There's some that are saying we need to kind of get away from, from that kind of backwoods uh, approach. Now, all of them were interested in sanctification, even the folks who weren't into revivalism that had to do with method. The other thing was the class meeting, as I had mentioned before. But also along with this was the style of worship. The style of worship had become more formal. And in particular, the introduction of instruments into worship. The big controversy was organs and choirs. And for uh, early Methodists, uh, that was just shameful to have a choir and one should not use an organ. Uh, John Wesley was opposed to choirs and, uh, and, and opposed to any instrument except maybe a, a, a lute more or less to kind of give you the note so you could uh, pitch on. Charles was a little more accommodating. He wouldn't mind a cello, uh, but, uh, but an organ was just uh, the equivalent of, you know, people bristle at, bristle at, um, at contemporary worship. The organ was the contemporary worship band uh, of its day. Um, but here's the logic behind it. The reason why Wesley was opposed to choirs is that he saw people joining choirs, not because they wanted to grow in holiness, but because they wanted to come and sing and perform. And, um, and it created cliques uh, and favoritism in the church. And having all this instrumentation turned worship into a performance rather than the real purpose of singing, which was to stir up the heart so that you now were in a spiritual, emotional position for the Holy Spirit uh, to come into your life. Listen this Sunday to uh, the first two hymns, and you'll get that language, right? Um, that's what's behind all of this. That if it looks on the surface, like what's a big deal about, you know, an organ? That's what's going on. Um, The issue of Methodism and slavery, as I said earlier, was not resolving itself 
even after the Southern Church uh, split off and formed, Northern Methodists were still stuck. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't pull the trigger on it. You know, it's estimated there's some 30,000 uh, slaves that were owned by Methodists still in the uh, part of the Northern denomination. And all those petitions just kept getting defeated over and over again. Um, so specifically, this gets played out in the Genesee Annual Conference, which is upstate New York. And the language they used at that time uh, in terms of the church, the conference politics is that the folks who were um, accommodating of those innovations were called the Regency Group. And the folks around B.T. Roberts and others were known as the Nazarites. And the other way they referred to it was is that the Regency Group, those folks, they were new school Methodists. And the Nazarites, we're old school Methodists. We're going to go back to the way Wesley uh, told us how to do it. Um, to give you an example, on a small level, played out in the Rushford District, May 1848, uh, they passed a, the preachers passed a resolution um, renewing their emphasis on, on church meetings, love feasts, and congregational singing, and banning choirs and instrumental music in the uh, district. So what happens in, in Genesee is a series of kind of church trials and accusations. And quite frankly, it's, it's, it's gossip that's going on and it's name calling among both of these groups and power plays, people getting shut out and who got appointed where and who got screwed over and which appointment. Um, so the major things that happens in 1855 uh, that annual conference uh, session, you know, they were electing delegates to general conference and the Regency group organized better uh, and got elected to represent the annual conference. At the same time, they did a smear campaign on people like B.T. Roberts claiming that these Nazarites had organized a Nazarite union that was operating as what? A secret society. <laughs> it's this kind of great political moment where the folks that are opposed to secret societies as the Masons now being accused of organizing a secret society in the annual conference. Um, 1855, a guy by Joseph McCreary uh, has charges brought against him. He's a Nazarite, right? Uh, but his presiding elder, Lauren Stiles, dismissed the charges. Uh, and then some of these Regency Group guys filed charges against Stiles for misadministering the, uh, the the book of discipline. Uh, so that's the stir going on. Uh, and then the next year, um, it's gotten so bad that the conference issues uh, a prohibition on, on all preachers publishing stuff, like stop writing about this, and especially putting it out in the, uh, in, in, in the town newspaper, right? Well, Roberts doesn't obey that. <sighs> Um, in the next year, he publishes an essay called New School Methodism, which is a theological critique of the Regency Group guys. And there's a trial that takes place at the 57 Annual Conference. He is found guilty, but then they struggle with the punishment. The punishment is, is asked to be uh, reprimanded by the bishop. In, in essence, he, on the last day in the evening of Annual Conference, he goes and stands before the bishop, and the bishop dressed him down, and that was it. But it also comes with that prohibition, don't do this again. Well, whether it was unknown to Roberts or not, uh, the following year, a guy named George Estes took his essay, republished it as a pamphlet and starts distributing it. And now there's a second trial of Roberts. Uh, and it is uh, in that trial uh, that he gets the boot. So now he has been kicked out of the denomination. Um, he appeals his case. But the appeal has to go to the general conference, right? And that next general conference is going to be 1860. So really from like 58 to 60, you're kind of in this sort of limbo where like on the edge of what's going to happen. Now, there's been others that have been uh, expelled as well uh, and people denied ordination as well. So it's like going on tit for tat throughout all of this. At the same time that it's going on, uh, one of these local preachers, not ordained, by the name of John Wesley Redfield, uh, begins doing evangelistic work 
in the Midwest, primarily in Missouri around St. Louis, and kind of spreading this Nazarightism uh, out there as well. So that during this time, you start to really kind of see two centers of gravity, upstate New York, and then around St. Louis and kind of in Michigan uh, and, and up there. All that then kind of culminates with a series of layman's conventions that take place that eventually lead to the founding of the denomination in 1860. Uh, they're taking place uh, uh, in upstate New York. And then finally you see there uh, in uh, the summer, there are two conventions held at the same time in New York City and in Chicago. They're basically at that point, June, July, uh, the, the, the general conference has been wrapping up, right? And once it ends, the general conference uh, dis, uh, does not hear, does not uh, overturn uh, Roberts's um, 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 uh, expulsion. And so that's kind of the last straw. So then August, 1860, they actually found the denomination. Now, let me go back a second here. ahead of myself. So just a little bit about the founding of it. Um, they too begin with kind of an anti-Episcopal uh, notion. Um, later, they will change that. And today there are bishops, free Methodist bishops, there's three of them. Um, they take on the name free um, because it works in multiple ways, uh, very much about free pews. Uh, but also the issue of slavery, uh, of course. Uh, they have a ban, a very strict ban, which is even to this day, on uh, being a member of a lodge. It has to do with taking a secret oath. Um, they, um, a number of other ways, their discipline kind of has a lot of the same features that the uh, other uh, Methodist denominations uh, will have. Um, but that would be one of the key, uh, the key things. Unlike the Wesleyans, where the Wesleyans, it was abolitionist anti-slavery by 1860. That's kind of one among many. Uh, it's really more the issue of membership in the lodge and, and the pews. And uh, slavery is kind of, oh yeah, oh, by the way, well, that just kind of confirms that these people are going to hell if they're doing that. So it's more of a collection around that. Um, so today, just, um, well, I'll come back to that in a second. One last note to make about B.T. Roberts. B.T. Roberts was a populist in his politics and uh, was supportive and instrumental in the founding of a populist organization uh, in the 1870s uh, called the Farmers Alliance, um, which actually grew to over 2 million family farms by 1892. He farmed on the side. Uh, in 1872, he'd given a lecture, turned it into a pamphlet called Conspiracies Against Farmers. So there is this kind of progressive populist uh, roots around, uh, around free Methodism and, and their founder. Uh, again, the emphasis on a church of, for the poor, uh, a church of equality, uh, and those sorts of things. So the issues that all of this brings up that are with us, obviously it is, you know, when do you separate? What are the limits of unity? And that's what they're wrestling with and what we're wrestling with today. I'm back here. Um, statistically, just to give you some highlights, uh, uh, today the, uh, the Wesleyan Church has approximately 500,000 members in the United States, almost 6,000 churches. Um, they do not have bishops. They have one general superintendent, but they do have district superintendents that are elected by their, their districts. And I think they, when they talk about districts, it's almost like what we would talk about as an annual conference. The, uh, the Free Methodist Church has, this is gonna be sound strange, they have 68,000 members. They have about 250,000 worshipers. The reason why that looks odd is because the understanding of membership uh, in their tradition, as with Church of the Nazarene, some others, 
you only become a member when you're really dedicated, serious about doing it. So they end up having traditionally small membership roles, large average attendance. It's the opposite of the United Methodist Church and mainline Protestants, where we take in members and, and then only a third of them or half of them come on a Sunday morning. Uh, they have one more two million uh, members worldwide and their headquarters are here in Indianapolis. So, so we pause there and uh, y'all can uh, jump on and say anything you want, ask any questions. Go ahead. I'll, ju I'll jump on. I grew up Wesleyan Methodist in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains. And I'm trying to put it all together in my life. And where all of this came from, I wasn't told any of this growing up. But my family, my father's side of the family were German. They were Hessians that came over and fought for the English. And after the Revolution War, they went up in the Adirondack Mountains. And there's a mountain that's named after the family had called Hartman Mountain. That was my maiden name. And that's where they started their Wesleyan Methodist tradition and, and beliefs. And um, so it was right after the Revolutionary War. And uh, I, I, I didn't even know where to start. <laughs> it, I, when did you grow up going to revivals? I'm sorry? Did you grow up going to revivals? Yes. And camp meetings. Yeah, camp meetings. Camp meetings, revivals. But one of the things that was very different, and I, and I don't know, again, if it was just my church, but the pastor's wife paid, played a major role. Yeah. The church built a house for them, a parsonage, um, very nice home. And they had a lot of meetings there. And that was sort of her area to take care of. And she, whenever he would, at the end of a service, she would stand next to him. Wow. And she was very much a part of, and their children were very much a part of the church. It was like a family. And she was there a lot, standing next to him and talking about her role in the church, which I, I think is just very interesting that, that she had such a major role in the church. It, one of the things that was interesting today in the, the book club I'm, I mentioned earlier, I mean, this is a diverse group. So we had several people who started as Southern Baptists and and some, some other denominations. And for many of them, I mean, this kind of information, the history of their own denominations was just not on the radar screen. It wasn't on mine. So I, I, find, I find that interesting, I guess. I think I'm trying to sort it all out because the church that I went to, um, I'll just give you examples. I couldn't go bowling because they sold beer. Yeah. My um, my cousin was queen of the prom and she couldn't go because there was dancing. And um, just I mean I could go on and on about what how I was raised that was so many things that were sinful that I couldn't participate in. Um, it's just it's just it was an interesting. Um, very strong family on my father's side that had been the founders of this and and you know were very strong in the Wesleyan Church and kept it going and, and it. so did growing up did you hear sermons about full sanctification no second blessing no not that language so at least not that language yeah yeah no but you can see I, I, I'm like, I'd always kind of wonder, like, what happened? I, I knew this, you know, this abolitionist history, in it, but yet today, almost the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And I, I think there is that switch that takes place. That's what I'm trying to figure out. They, they lost the leadership that would have kept that. And then all that energy becomes spiritualized, moralized, individualized. So the same passion against slavery now is against drinking beer at the, uh, at the bowling alley. I had relatives who went to, to Houghton College, um, Wesleyan University. Um, just, you know, it was, it was just entrenched in my father's side of the family. I mean, that's where you went. That's where my cousins went. I, I wonder, Darren, 
I mean, it seems to me in any organization, if you lose your reason for being, you better find another one quick or you're not going to be around. That's my sister. Just later. Yeah. That's the point. And you have, you know, what was a movement getting institutionalized. You know, you see that the free methods especially. Yeah. Yeah. Did anyone else grow up free Methodist or Wesleyan? Or... Oh, Becky, you did? You were... Oh, yeah, I grew up uh, free Methodist and my extended family was Nazarene, holiness, uh, non-denominational. So I went to all those kind of churches and, and I had good friends in high school that were Wesleyan. So yeah, we had all those prohibitions of certain activities. Where did you grow up? Uh, well, the church I went to was Brightwood Free Methodist. Oh, here in town? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And interesting thing about that was that during the years I was in college, the neighborhood became uh, mostly black. The church attempted to integrate, but it didn't work. So as membership dropped off, they combined with another Free Methodist church in town. So by the time I got out of college, the church home was gone, yeah. you know. So. I, um, a good friend of ours, she's now passed, but when she was growing up, Free Methodist, and this was down in Petersburg, Indiana, uh, they did not use uh, instruments, so it was a cappella singer. And when she married, uh, did not have a wedding band. Uh, there was that emphasis. And again, it goes along with holiness that, you know, we're not going to wear makeup, we're not ostentatious dress, and those sorts of things. So we had, we had music and instruments, and but one thing that was strange to me is when I found out other denominations didn't allow women to preach or be ordained, because that was something that I grew up with. And I thought that was very strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here's this great conservative theological tradition, and yet both of them just they have women from the get-go. It's no big deal. And again, I think that's the when if you think about the Trinity, like which person of the Trinity you gotta emphasize, if you emphasize the spirit, which is what they're doing. Then you get everybody talking, you know, black, white, poor, women, you know, it's uh, uh, other traditions that I think struggle with a lot more. So. Hey, Darren, here in Indiana, is Indiana Wesleyan a Wesleyan school? Oh, yeah, it's very much their uh, flagship uh, school. And what happened after the Civil War, what happens after Crooks is, is the, the denomination basically moves to Northern Indiana as kind of its main base. Uh, and all of that, it's uh, Indiana Wesleyan. And, you know, just in the past, what, 15 years, they actually started a seminary. So for the longest time, you know, you did not have the educational requirements that you would have had in the United Methodist Church around that, so. Well, my brother went to Illinois Wesleyan, which is a very Methodist school. Yeah. When, yeah. We, when we moved here, I was like, what is this Indiana Wesleyan? Because it's totally different, right? So, yeah. which may be why originally it wasn't when they called themselves Wesleyan Methodist, it's like, we're not just Methodist, we're, we're Wesleyan Methodist. Yeah. We're not just white, we're super white, <laughs> you know. Um, I grew up in the northern Indiana town where the Free Methodists were headquartered, yeah. which was Winona Lake, Indiana, just a few blocks down the street from their world headquarters, but really didn't know anything about them, except they were more liberal than the Grace Brethren. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> almost everybody was i mean you know the grace brethren were like to the right of genghis khan okay if you you know um anyway but they the kids in their youth group could go bowling but we couldn't because they had pool tables in some of the bowling alleys and that was uh considered you know, kind of risque. Um, 
because people bet on pool games. But they they had a light and life press that I think was in Winona Lake. I think and, the move to Indianapolis was to ship ship. Um, I didn't know anything about them. Um, I mean, the kids in the youth group were nice, nice, nice kids. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we were, of course, the greatest brother and thought anybody who wasn't them was suspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I saw the free Methodist as just as suspect as everybody, but they weren't nearly as liberal as those United Methodists, <laughs> who we thought were all yeah. going to hell. Yeah, beyond the pale. Yeah, yeah they were beyond the pale, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but they used to be headquartered mm -hmm. in the same tiny little town where the Grace Brethren were headquartered, just blocks apart from each other, but not interacting at all. When we first married, Liz suspected the uh, North United Methodist Church. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm being. Well, you know. if you think about North and what architecturally what it represents, of course, you know, this 1930s, it's much later, but the evolution of, of Methodism on this corner represents that cultural shift from Puget Station and then you that white clabbered church, which is kind of solidly middle class. And then, you know, 1930, you know, we're going uptown. We got this, we got our cathedral, right? And a cathedral that will house a magnificent organ and a choir and, and all of that. Um, there are Sundays, I think to myself, Wesley's probably rolling over in his grave if he could watch our YouTube broadcast. But, uh, What's going on there? So, even recently, um, the first time my brother came in our church, and he has always gone to small Methodist church in small towns, other than we were growing up. He was like, "This is a Methodist church." <laughs> I mean, it just didn't fit, kind of, with small yeah. town Methodist, right? Yeah, my my take on it is, you know, Bishop Leet was the bishop that oversaw this um, restart, and is essentially what we were, and it took them a long time. So the desire to start North Church really kind of goes back to, you know, right around World War I. Uh, but uh, but I, I think he had very much a notion that he wanted to see a cathedral built there. So um, uh, and I think there was a lot of that kind of driving it. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I don't know if everybody saw Jacqueline's comment in the chat. I thought it was pretty interesting about that. Maybe you can read that, Darren, to everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's see here. Uh, Disciples of Christ split with their sister Campbellite denomination over issues of musical instruments. Yeah. Uh, 20th century disciples, historians showed that you could pretty well predict which congregation joined which denomination by whether or not the church door was large enough to bring an organ into the building. That's true. Well, and here's the, the footnote to her footnote is uh, the church of Christ, which is a denomination, is a part of that Campbellite tradition, and they explicitly have no musical instruments. Uh, if you've ever heard of David Lipscomb College, which is down in Nashville, that's that tradition. And the, the Campbellites, they are part of that Second Great Awakening. They're right there in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, 1800, when you know they're having the camp meetings just like the Methodists are in the Baptists. But it takes the, um, the Campbellites a very long time to actually form into a denomination, which doesn't happen until the late 1950s. So what we know as the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, is, is, is that late forming because they were a congregational system. All right. uh, but the ones who didn't go on into that merger was what you see as the Church of Christ. So. Hey, Jill. You need to unmute. Yeah, gotcha. Um, when I was in um, oh, fourth grade on through junior high and high school, uh, my parents moved over by what was Indiana Central College, now University of Indianapolis. Mm 
And there was an EUB, Evangelical United Brethren Church, that we started attending when I was a kid all the way through high school. So where does that fit? Yeah, so the EUBs, and I didn't include them in this uh, because they didn't break away. They rather, they joined with us. But if you go all the way back, Methodism is a part of a really a worldwide movement that you would call pietism. And so you have pietistic expressions in different strains, uh, including Lutheran and Reformed. And so the uh, EUBs are they're pietistic, but they're coming out of kind of Lutheran and reform background. Oh. They, they came, they're, they're settlers come to the United States, primarily in Pennsylvania, coming out of a Lutheran background, uh, Calvinist background, a little bit of Mennonite thrown in there as well. Uh, but, but again, they all get involved with this second great awakening, right? So that's like the, the, the thing that jiggies and everything up and there's this new combination. So one of their founders, one of the Brethren founders, Otterbein, he's actually present at the Christmas conference. He actually helps ordain Asbury. Oh my gosh. But, and, but they never, they didn't merge for the longest time. And I think it, it had to do over two issues. One was language, speaking German versus English, but more importantly, a different style of church governance. There's a little more democracy in the uh, United Brethren tradition. But the Brethren's, and I believe it was 46, 1946, merged with the Evangelical Association, uh, which is where you get the E in EUB. Right. The, the Evangelical Association also started up about that time. More, They were more of a Lutheran background. Otterbein was more Reformed background. But again, Second Great Awakening, Revivalism. Gotcha. The Evangelical Association, they always wanted to merge with the Methodists. Yeah, and I thought were talking with Asbury, and Asbury would never get back and follow through on it. So they, they came together in, four, I believe it was 46 EUBs, and then we merged in 68 with them. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the 1968 merge. Yeah. So, um, but there's kind of this common pietistic tradition uh, that's, that, that, that was there. Um, so. Interesting. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. I'm just speaking about music. Um, I was um, started playing the cello in junior high, actually sixth grade. And um, that became a part of my role in the church. And they would always put me in the front of the church and have me play the cello. If I had played another instrument, I would not have given, been given that kind of attention, but because I would play, played the cello, that was such a big part of, of what they wanted me to do for the church hmm. that I, I played a number of times uh, it, during services. Yeah, interesting. Darren, you mentioned that before. What was so holy about the cello? Well, I think it, it wasn't so much the answer. I think it's because of the simplicity of it. Okay. Uh, and it was really more like you can play it in order to assist with congregational singing. It wouldn't, it wouldn't overwhelm the congregation. If you think about an organ, an organ, yeah, you know, drives it just like a praise band will uh, do that. And, and for the Wesley's early Methodists, it was all about singing together congregational singing and that kind of experience. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Any last I, question or comment? Yeah. I find the comments about secret societies interesting. The denomination I grew up in had a prohibition on membership in secret societies. And I just thought it was kind of part of the unique weirdness of our congregation, I mean, of our denomination. Yeah. I didn't realize it had been a big national issue, but the theology behind it was that secret societies, you know, the secrecy, the secrecy of those societies was contrary to the openness and truth of the gospel. And that's why we should not be a member of them. 
Yeah, and then you add on to that all kinds of blown out of proportion conspiracy theories about, you know, what are they doing down at the lodge? It's secret, you know, what's going on in there, right? And <laughs> uh, I mean, I got a dose of that uh, growing up and in, in kind of hearing about, well, you know, the Antichrist is a part of the Masonic Lodge and, and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. We heard a lot about sanctification, but the word holiness was not used. Mm. I learned about the holiness movement in seminary. Um, but, you know, we, we had regular sermons on sanctification, you know, on basically needing to progress to a holier and holier life. But holiness was not a word used. It was always sanctification. So next week or last week, we're going to be talking directly about the holiness movement and how it evolved. Um, Liz, tell me again the name of the denomination you grew up in. It was called Grace Brethren. And they were a believer's baptism church, not infant baptism. Yeah. The brethren dunk three times. I refer to it as kind of salvation by near drowning. <laughs> so you get, well, next week, I'll, I'll try and remember that. There's this, the whole yeah. movement, it, 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 it extends across denominations. And so it impacts in some different ways and um i'll i'll keep it on my rear screen um so next week uh we'll wrap up uh talking about uh primarily the church of the nazarene uh talking about the uh the church of god out of anderson indiana uh and um and kind of the evolution of some of this stuff in the uh methodist church as well so all right, folks. Thanks so much. Yeah, you. Yeah. That's good. 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 Yeah.